mention. I'm happy to be back speaking today. And as it was just mentioned, we are still living with this ongoing rabbit pandemic. We're hopeful that it looks like COVID for us might be quieting down, but um, we'll, we'll deal with what's going on with rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus and go over some updates and some current information. And I'll share as much as I can that we've learned over the last year and what we all need to know. And, and I guess the most significant take home from this. So today we'll cover just some basic review of what is RHDV2, a little bit of review for many of you, but we'll try to touch on some important points. We'll look at where we are now and what's happened over the last few years as this disease has continued to spread throughout the country. Fortunately, not as quickly or as far as we anticipated years ago. We'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology of the disease and then we'll, we'll talk a bit about current vaccinology. Um, certainly vaccines are an important part of controlling this disease. So we'll touch on the latest information about that as well. So what is RHDV2? Well, again, many of us probably know it's a very highly contagious and very fatal virus that affects domestic and feral rabbits. RHDV2, as the name implies, is a new strain, not to be confused with previous strains that have been seen in other parts of the world or have even shown up in the United States. But RHDV2 is the focus of this lecture and the focus of the ongoing current pandemic affecting rabbits at this time. There are a few spillover events that have been recently seen. Um, one of those was in a Eurasian badger that was found to actually be affected with the virus and the virus was able to replicate in them and that badger was actually able to shed the virus. So we're only just learning that this virus that historically has only affected rabbits may actually be able to be replicated in other animals and they may be able to shed the virus and it may not cause the same symptoms in them. That's some ongoing research, and we're learning more about that every day. As of right now, other than that and a few other experimental studies, it generally affects only rabbits, including wild and domestic rabbits. We've seen die-offs in populations since 2020. We know that rabbits that have been vaccinated with the RHDV vaccine are not protected against RHDV2. It is a mutated unique strain and previous vaccines that have been used in Europe for other variants will not work for this disease. It is a reportable disease to the World Organization for Animal Health. So it's being tracked on a global scale and that's really important. That helps denote a bit more of a seriousness to it. And that's something that we want to contribute to helping our understanding and our ability to learn, control, and hopefully start making some predictions in the future about where this disease is going. Um, it's highly contagious. That's one of the things that has scared a lot of us over the years. We know that the uh, disease tends to be what we call sticky, and it can be on food, it can be on, on clothing, carriers, the bottoms of shoes, um, other pets can bring it in on their feet. So it's, it's considered to be a sticky virus, and that's been a big problem with it. Historically, it's had a pretty high mortality rate, although we don't have exact scientific statistics on that. Part of the reason we don't is because we don't have any way to know how many wild rabbits die from it. Wild rabbits die from a number of other causes, or they may die from this disease, but nobody knows. We don't track all those. Um, say a, a, a group of rabbits died from this disease and then their, their bodies were eaten by coyotes. You know, we would never know or be able to test it. So we don't have a really good way to track the amount of death in wild populations. We only have ways to know when wild rabbits are found dead and are tested. Otherwise, there's no exact counts. The most important thing is it is now considered endemic in 11 states in the USA. What this might mean now in 2022 compared to back in 2020 and even early 2021 is when it becomes endemic in a state, the state veterinarian may not want to do as much testing. And I've heard from other veterinarians that in some states, they may not want to do any more testing. They may say the disease is here. We know the rabbits have it. 
we don't need to test anymore because it's considered endemic here. If a rabbit died with the symptoms owing to it, then they would be a suspect case. Again, it doesn't help with numbers and it doesn't help if it's a pet rabbit and the state veterinarian does not wanna do further testing. But um, it is something to be aware of if you're dealing with this and you call your state veterinarian from an endemic state, they may or may not take it as seriously today as they did a year or two ago. The virus is considered um, very stable because it's non-enveloped and that just has to do with the outer surface and, the, and the, the actual structure of the virus. But that makes it able to withstand high and hot and cold temperatures. Um, it can remain stable for many, many months at room temperature where we like to think that if a virus is not in its host, it doesn't survive. But this virus is a bit of an exception to that because it does not need to be in the host to survive and still remain infectious. Um, it can survive at freezing for over seven months. It can survive excessive heating. So we know that it, it's pretty resilient and it's probably why it's most of its um, endemicness is in the Western United States. We also know that um, environmental temperature and protection by organic material are important factors. So. Um, if we're in areas where there are not temperature extremes or there are organic materials for it to survive on, it's going to last longer. And then there have been some seasonal outbreaks. And there are a lot of factors in wild populations of rabbits that affect seasonal outbreaks. Certainly those have to do with, with when rabbits are reproducing, when there's more activity for feeding, when there may be needs for movement, for, for finding food, things like that. So seasonal variation, weather variations, environmental differences, a lot of those will affect it and that can certainly affect the seasonality of outbreaks in the wild. Again, because of how well it survives, we at least know what disinfectants are effective. And this is an important aspect of biosecurity is knowing that we can disinfect and eliminate the virus. We all remember with COVID, it was wash your hands and wear a mask. Well, we have to consider the biosecurity principles that work for this virus in our, in our rabbits. Um, certainly um, sodium hypochlorite household bleach, the miracle that seems to kill everything at the right dilutions works well for this. The other one is that's most common is accelerated hydrogen peroxide products like Rescue, which can be bought on Amazon or commercially. It's used in many veterinary hospitals, it's used in zoos, and it's a, a very commonly used disinfectant that we know will kill this virus as well. And then potassium peroxy monosulfate or Vircon is another commercially available disinfectant. And a lot of times the best thing to do is bury them. Find the ones that work. If you're in a shelter, use one for a month or two and then switch to a different one. This is what most human hospitals do and what a lot of veterinary hospitals do so that they don't have to rely on just the same disinfectant. There may be others that work, but these are the three that we know work. The rescue wipes also work. So they come in a pop-up canister like wet wipes. And we know that with a minute or two contact time, those work as well. So we at least have the advantage of knowing we can disinfect to prevent the spread of this virus. There's a link here to a USDA PDF um, that basically explains all of the disinfectants and how they work and, and how long to use them, um, which can be provided for anybody that wants it at a later time. But again, biosecurity and vaccination are gonna remain our best defenses against this virus. So an image from the website, rhdv2.com, which um, originally was set up and was the, the most current information. And it's gone through a few little lapses, but it's, it's largely reliable. Um, and this is a chart from that site. Um, I was speaking at a conference and I met somebody that works on um, the website and is keeping it as current as possible, which is great. But we know that generally back as far as 1984, um, we had an RHD, RHD outbreak, rapid hemorrhagic disease. Um, it had moved to um, North America in the 1990s. RHDV1, a new strain emerged in 2000. And then RHDV2, the one we're talking about, basically emerged after 2010 with outbreaks in 2018 in Ohio, 2019 in the Pacific Northwest and Canada. And then RHDV2 vaccines became available in Europe to control the disease there. 
And then starting in about 2020, we had our, our outbreaks in the Southwest United States and Mexico, and everything largely just started kind of growing from there. Recent RHDV2 in North America, most recent domestic confirmations have been in indoor only domestic rabbits. And this is certainly something that we really should pay attention to because we're seeing rabbits dying from this disease that we in no way can link their exposure. These are indoor only rabbits that do not leave the home. They don't have other rabbits. Um, obviously it's being brought into the home to expose them. Um, we don't always know how to trace that back, but domestic confirmations on indoor rabbits that have no exposure um, even directly to wild rabbits is something we need to, of course, pay attention to. Um, Minnesota, Kentucky, Florida, New York, California, Idaho, and, and in Canada have largely been reporting the domestic confirmations in indoor rabbits. And then in 2022, this year, we have cases in New Mexico and California. And what that means is it makes three years of successive confirmations for New Mexico, California, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Texas is the only state from the first reported group that hasn't reported anything in 2022 yet, along with Montana, both of which had wilded domestic ferals confirmed. So we haven't seen the spread across the entire continent like they saw in Australia a few years ago, where the disease made it from one side of the continent to the other in three to four months. We luckily have not seen that, but we are seeing continued reporting, continued cases in new counties, new areas, new parts of these states. So the states that have it are continuing to show it. I see there was a request to put the link in the chat, which I can do right after we finish the, the talk, or I can email that to the organizers and make sure if anybody wants a copy of the presentation or wants any of the direct links, those will all be provided for you either after the conference or in an immediate email following. It's important to note that even without a local wild reservoir, the disease can appear. So there may not have been reported confirmed deaths in wild animals, there may not have been reported deaths in domestic rabbits, but we have seen rabbits die from this. So, you know, we might want to say thank humans, in a sense, that's what we do, um, inadvertently moving rabbits, um, adoptions, pet store movement of rabbits, rabbit shows, um, meat rabbits and the movement of those. I mean, there's been a lot of ways that we know that virus could move around including all of the fomites, you know, being carried by insects and, and carried on clothing or car tires. So, um, you know, a lot of what we do, that's just part of normal life, inadvertently can help things move around. So the RHDV2 spread looking at a map, which might make it a bit easier, this is what we knew of in March 2020. So two years and a month ago, you can see the domestic cases, the wild cases, and then the brown is just an overlap where areas where they reported both domestic and wild cases. So this is March 2020 when this largely first started. Then we moved to December 2021, and you can see the difference there. Um, the data is all from the USDA, from the RHD awareness team. But you can see it largely stayed in this, the Southwest and the Western United States with some sporadic domestic cases in random locations, Florida, Georgia, New York, but basically staying in the Western United States. And then we move to December, 2021, where we look at our endemic states and we look at the reporting. So it is basically moved to the half of the United States with domestic cases reported in all of the states that are in yellow. And then the brown basically is considered to be the domestic and wild cases. Um, it's interesting how Washington is kind of spared because they had some early RHDV cases, but this is where we have it um, as far as the current maps and the most current information of where the disease exists. Mexico and Canada, this may not be up to date because we just can't get the most current data from those places. For those of you that didn't know this, Mexico actually developed their own vaccine against this disease years ago. 
Um, they kept it only in Mexico. They did not distribute it. It was not available anywhere else, but they started using it because of the severity of the disease in Mexico. And we know that it has spread through most of that state. Some people theorize it could easily have moved up from Mexico into that region of the United States, um, finding its way into New Mexico and Arizona and California, unless it originated in other areas and moved its way south into Mexico. And of course, it's been seen in Canada as well. Again, this data is a little bit hard to, to find exact information, but this is what we know up till now. And again, Mexico did develop their own vaccine and started using it um, pretty early on in the pandemic. And that was probably a good thing. And that probably helped control a lot of it. And that may be a big factor in why it hasn't spread further, or at least let's hope so. So remember that rabbits, you know, we still consider them a prey species. And we like to think that prey species would normally by nature hide symptoms, not want to show they're weak or ill. But we know that our pet rabbits, we can certainly recognize when they're sick. And we know what symptoms to look for when they're not doing well. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the symptoms of this virus are vague symptoms. They're nonspecific. Um, loss of appetite, lethargy, like, you know, sort of listlessness. Um, any of those kind of symptoms of fever, we know rabbits can develop a fever from a lot of different causes, but we do certainly get into some that are less common or more specific, um, seizures, jaundice, which is secondary to liver damage, which we know this disease has a propensity to do. Certainly bleeding is not going to be that common. So if we have spontaneous bleeding and we don't have a cause for it, like the rabbit didn't ingest, say, rat poison that causes bleeding. Um, it's not something isolated to another disease process. Um, if a rabbit had a bloody nose, but turned out that it had a growth in the nasal cavity that was bleeding. But certainly, as the name implies, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, we expect there to be some degree of bleeding. And this is one of the confusing parts of it because that's not always found or identified on the outside of the rabbit. Many of these rabbits are just found dead with nonspecific symptoms, and there may not be any evidence at all of bleeding on the outside. And a lot of times it's only found once they have an, a necropsy or an autopsy, and they can evaluate that there may be internal bleeding, or they can identify the damage in the liver. But again, any sudden death in an endemic state should be considered suspicious and should be reported to a veterinarian or your state veterinarian if there's any concern that it could be related to this disease. We are still in that phase of this. We do wanna still try to report it. We wanna make sure our state veterinarians are aware that we all care about it, that we're staying on top of it. We wanna make sure that they're notified when there are cases, when there's suspicion, when there's concerns, because that's the only way that we're gonna keep them involved. There are lots of other issues developing now that state veterinarians have to deal with, avian influenza, um, other diseases in wild populations. So it's our job to make sure that we stay on top of reporting and keeping it current. Again, we mentioned a little bit of this before, but um, how the disease is spread, um, basically a rabbit comes in contact with an infected rabbit from their urine, their feces, their respiratory secretion. To date, we have not documented transplacental infection. So that's really good. I don't know if that's going to be um, rediscovered, but an infected um, doe is not going to transfer this to her unborn. So let's hope it stays that way. Certainly indirect contact, human contact, um, again, inanimate objects, clothing, car tires, shoes, any of those type of things can, can bring the disease in. And also exposure can occur anywhere, in the wild, in shelters, in foster homes, in wildlife rescue centers, veterinary hospitals, we have to be extremely careful, especially if it's a high volume rabbit clientele um, and with any movement of rabbits. Um, there was a, a, a case where it was suspected that the disease was brought into a state for somebody that was attending a rabbit show. I think it was largely disproved and the rabbit was retested negative. But we do know that the movement does increase the chance of moving a disease around and that's one thing that we also need to be really careful about. Again, rabbit products can move the disease, fur, meat, wool from those Angora rabbits that are, are uh, their fur is collected. Um, it was also shown that um, the virus survived processing of some meat when it was cooked. 
So we have to consider that. And then the mechanical vectors, uh, predators. Um, insects can transmit it, birds, rodents, other predators. So there's always the risk that it can move around. So again, what we know is, is the virus has a lot of ways to move around the rabbit population, a lot of ways to get in and a lot of ways to infect um, both feral and domestic rabbits. Again, it also includes virus contaminated food and water. So uh, at the beginning of this, there was a lot of concern about um, pellets and hay and the virus being in those. There was concern about um, getting vegetables grown in states that were endemic. Um, we don't have any definitive that we've ever traced a rabbit getting this to eating vegetables that had it or plants. Um, a lot of the, the pet food companies, especially Oxbow, does not source from endemic states for their hay. So they've taken a step to be really careful. Um, they did have one state that it did happen, but they did um, not sell that or not use that product for a long enough period of time to confirm that there was no virus on it. Um, so the, the food connection is, is real, but is not something we've seen be a huge problem or considered to be a huge risk. The incubation mortality, um, again, the virus takes only about three to five days to incubate before that animal can shed. So subacute infections can occur. And if it's mild enough and it doesn't cause severe signs, those rabbits generally may survive. And we have to assume that there are wild rabbits that got infected. They were immunocompetent. They were able to survive. And then they may have shed that virus, but they didn't necessarily die from it. The paracute infection are those rabbits that get it, the virus takes over, and generally they'll collapse and die pretty quickly. Um, again, death can be as soon as three to five days. Um, I misspoke before when I said the, um, the incubation period is three to nine days, generally. Um, it's somewhere in that range. We know it's fairly short. I mentioned earlier as well, the mortality rates. It's a little hard to know because there's no way to know exactly every single rabbit that has died from this. We don't have an exact count. Um, in the 2020 outbreak, officials were reporting death rates of 90% or more. But again, we owe back to the confusion of calculating how much death there is in wild populations. So it's really hard to know. Um, survivors that can shed the virus if they don't die from it for up to 42 days, maybe longer, which is important to know when we're thinking about quarantine procedures and we're thinking about the likelihood of the shed of the virus. And again, asymptomatic carriers up to two months shedding. So keep those numbers in mind when we're again trying to think of quarantine, we're trying to think of how we're going to protect our rabbits, that type of thing. And just a little bit about the pathophysiology. The virus targets the liver. Basically what it does is it kills the liver. So it causes necrosis and eventual liver failure. When the liver's not working, it's not producing those clotting factors or it leads to abnormal blood clot formation, which then affects blood flow. The liver can swell. When the liver is not working, it can lead to neurologic symptoms because the liver is not filtering toxins. Um, it can also lead to kidney damage. Um, and if the kidney's not working, it's not filtering, it's not reclaiming nutrients that are supposed to stay in the body. All of this together leads to the eventual hemorrhage that we see. Overuse of clotting factors, loss of liver function, um, the inability for platelets to work well, and that leads to, as the name implies, a hemorrhagic state. So eventually the disease will lead to some bleeding but in the short term, the virus is largely targeting the liver and internal organs. And as a subset of all the metabolic derangements that occur, leads to the bleeding. People always ask about testing and people of course are always asking, is there a way to test rabbits? Can I test my own rabbits? You know, is there any way to, to do that? My rabbit is, has a fever and has not been eating. Can we test him for that? Unfortunately not. At this point, up until, it's only been allowed to be tested through contacting your state veterinarian. So the state veterinarian would be called, there would be a suspect case, and they would arrange for the testing. And it had to go through a state veterinarian. Even your family veterinarian could not submit testing. There may be a little bit of change in this right now, but I haven't heard anything specific. So as far as I know, 
it still has to go through a state, state veterinarian to be tested. And unfortunately, a state veterinarian is not involved until a rabbit has died. Um, an autopsy would be performed, samples would be collected. There are several state labs that are being given approval to do testing. Historically, it's only been through one lab in the country. So all samples had to go to New York, to the USDA animal plant lab um, up there for testing. But now we know that multiple state labs are being given approval for testing, but again, still only through a reported case to your state veterinarian. Again, as of right now, there is no antemortem testing. Um, if there's anything that anybody knows that I don't, of course, I'm, I'm very much open to hearing that and correcting if I've made a mistake, but that's my current understanding. So vaccinology and vaccination, um, vitally important with this disease. As uh, many of you may know, or if you've had rabbits vaccinated in the past, the two vaccines that we were importing both from Spain and France were given a, an emergency use authorization by the USDA. So we didn't have a domestically produced vaccine. We wanted to start vaccinating rabbits. So the USDA allowed veterinarians to import vaccines from Europe. Now keep in mind, these are not approved to be used in the USA. They're not part of um, our core vaccines. They're considered a foreign biological. They're approved to use in other, other countries, but the USDA made an exception and allowed us to import them. So we had Aravac and Filovac. Um, these were both annual vaccines. We knew from the years of using them in Europe that they were effective for most rabbits. No vaccine is 100%. We all heard that when they told us about COVID vaccines. We know that about vaccinating our pets for any other diseases. There's never a 100% guarantee, but we like those numbers to be pretty close to that. Um, vaccine is definitely recommended in the face of exposure. So we wanna re recommend that rabbits that are exposed in endemic areas or where there's wild population outbreaks, or definite reporting is a place to use it. Um, immunity is generally about a week after the vaccine is administered. We also need to consider biosecurity with vaccination. We cannot rely on vaccination alone. We heard that all the time with COVID, the same applies with this disease as well. Um, RHDV2 is unique though, in that it's fatal to young rabbits where previous strains did not affect rabbits under 10 weeks of age. They seem to be fairly immune to the previous strains of RHDV, but RHDV2 in a sense will take no prisoners. So um, it was important that we knew that and it's important that we use that in vaccine strategies. Filovac, rabbits can be vaccinated at least four weeks old then annually, Aravac 30 days old and then annually. Neither of these vaccines required a booster. They were given once and then you followed up a year later and the expectation was that if the rabbit mounted an appropriate immune response, they would be protected as best as possible within a week, and we would have um, protection ongoing. Probably the biggest news, and again, many of you probably know this already, but if you don't, Medgene Labs is a, a United States-based um, pharmaceutical or I guess immunological services providing company based out of South Dakota. They were founded in 2011 and they developed a veterinary focus in 2014, but largely producing vaccines for large animals and farm animals. But um, they basically had a goal of bringing innovative ideas and technology through vaccines. And they're dedicated to improving animal health. That's part of their slogan and what they want um, to push forward through their lab. There are some emerging diseases that they're focused on, and then there are some other diseases that they do not have vaccines for that are focus of them as well. But this was the first company to step up and take over the RHDV2 vaccine. So they have now produced an inactivated or killed recombinant subunit vaccine that binds, builds immunity to RHDV2. So the USDA and MedGene partnered so that we could move rapidly towards the development of a vaccine. Again, it kind of parallels COVID when that hit. We needed a domestically produced vaccine and MedGene was able to do that. Their vaccine is now commercially available. It should be fully protective, basically about two weeks after the second vaccine booster which is about a month after the first. So this vaccine does require a booster. So a rabbit would be vaccinated. They would get a booster vaccine about a month later. 
and then they would get the vaccine annually rather than the other European vaccines were just once a year. Um, it is labeled for animals four weeks and older, but keep in mind, it's a very new vaccine and it's only used as emergency use only. They have not done extensive, extensive studies and testing on it that we think of with other vaccines like rabies or other diseases like that. Um, a study on the safety in nursing and pregnant dose has not been done and a few other areas that they need to do some more research. But again, we have a domestically produced vaccine that appears to be safe and effective that is available. It was very difficult to jump through all the hoops to import the European vaccines and also could potentially be um, cost ineffective. So this met all of those needs for our emergency use at this time. The way they basically develop the, the vaccine and the process has to go through um, challenges to confirm that it works. And basically what they found was that almost 70% of rabbits died that did not receive the vaccine when challenged with the disease compared to the rabbits that were vaccinated and then exposed to the disease, none of them died. So they found that to be fairly efficacious. And that was the proof that the USDA needed to allow it to be used. You're saying that you vaccinated some rabbits, didn't vaccinate others, exposed them all to the disease, and then all of the ones that were vaccinated did not die, but almost 70% of the unvaccinated did. Um, it sounds horrible and we hate to think of that, but that is the very nature of biotechnological research and how we produce these vaccines. And then the secondary post-vaccine um, outcomes, basically the clinical signs they observed um, in those rabbits that um, were not vaccinated, they developed fevers, lethargy, and then no nosebleeds most commonly. Um, most of the other ones just had a transient fever. And then some of the ones that were vaccinated had a transient fever, which resolved in two to three days. The good news is they didn't observe any other severe or significant um, side effects. Um, they weren't seeing animals having anaphylactic reactions. They weren't having um, the need to treat that. The mild symptoms of a transient fever were the same things that we see when anybody gets a vaccine. That's supposed to happen because that means your body's mounting an immune response to the vaccine. Um, we all know that that was one of the things they warned us about with COVID. We also know that with some rabbits, just the stress of going to the vet, having an exam, getting a vaccine, all of that can cause a little bit of stress and anxiety. And, you know, owners that reported, oh, they didn't eat as much when they got home. Well, is that from the vaccine or is that from just getting vaccinated and going to the vet, getting poked with a needle? Um, to date at my hospital, we have vaccinated thousands of rabbits with the European imported vaccines. We're waiting until we run out of those to order MedGene, but we have not seen any severe adverse reactions. Owners have reported a, a transient fever, a little bit of resolving lethargy. We've had one or two rabbits that were sensitive at the injection site, um, but no severe, serious adverse reactions to date. And we hope it stays that way because that's another important aspect of vaccinology. And then the field safety studies, um, three different locations in the state um, using animals that were young, um, actually basically just looking for adverse reactions to the vaccine to prove that it's safe. One of the things that the USDA is not going to do is permit use of a vaccine, even if there's emergency use, if it leads to a lot of adverse reactions. Then owners are not going to want it. It's not going to be financially feasible and we're not going to risk it. So we needed to prove that this vaccine was safe and effective, which I believe to date we have done. <clears throat> Again, the Veterinary Center for Veterinary Biologicals through the USDA has reported the vaccine is efficacious, can be used in animals four weeks and older, but again, it is still through an emergency use authorization. State animal health officials um, requested to distribute the vaccine. 45 states currently are approved for emergency use. So 45 of the 50 states in the US can purchase this, veterinarians in those states can purchase this vaccine for use um, in rabbits today. Um, shipments have to go to licensed veterinarians, they have to register with MedGene, um, and then they have to report, there's some reporting that's required while it's still under emergency use so that the USDA can track it. Another important thing to know is the vaccine does not affect PCR testing. So there's no vaccine interference. When, when people say, oh, if you get vaccinated and then you get tested for that disease, is the test finding the vaccine 
not necessarily the disease, but that doesn't happen with this. So if a rabbit is vaccinated um, and then say it were to pass away, if it were tested and it tested positive, it's not from the vaccine. It would mean that they actually got it. And again, no vaccine is 100% effective. Not all animals have a complete immune reaction. If you think about it, if you're at a vaccine clinic and hundreds of animals are getting vaccinated, there's always the chance that somebody accidentally doesn't get the vaccine in the right place. If it's a very furry rabbit, the vaccine doesn't quite make it under the skin and it goes in the fur, but nobody notices and that one gets missed. I mean, there are possibilities. I hope that doesn't happen very frequently, but certainly it is a consideration. But we do know that um, getting these rabbits vaccinated is, is a very key component and very important. A uh, question that just popped up in the chat, what is it gonna take to approve it? Further studies. It's gonna require more studies um, to, to prove that it's, it's safe and um, should be moved into general. So again, as of April, 2022, um, it's manufactured and available in multi-dose vials. The company is not planning to produce single dose vials. As of right now, they've distributed over 30,000 doses under the Emergency Use Act. And to go back to your question, it's gonna require further studies in order for them to pull off the emergency use and give it a conditional use. Um, the vaccine expires about two years later. You can contact, a veterinarian can contact the company, go to their website, set up an account, order the vaccine. It's shipped overnight, Monday through Wednesday. And um, they have a customer service number and their customer service is available to anybody. So if you have general questions, concerns, your veterinarian has questions, um, this phone number is available for a customer service and they can be contacted. Again, that question in the chat, um, the conditional license would follow approval of additional field safety data. So one of the things we don't have yet because the disease is only a couple years old is duration of immunity. We know if you give a vaccine, how long does it actually protect those animals? Does it last longer than a year? Maybe we'll find that out. Maybe a rabbit that gets vaccinated two or three years in a, in a row will then be protected for three years after that. So duration of immunity is something that needs to be evaluated before the conditional approval. Um, response reaction in animals previously given the European vaccines needs to be evaluated, although we're not seeing any issue with that. And we're not seeing any problem with rabbits getting the MedGene vaccine that have had the European vaccines. Um, and again, full commercial licensure, again, to address that chat comment, um, is, is based on approval of the potency assays and different data relating to the drug use. They are anticipating they will get a conditional release in 2023. So that will remove emergency use, that will make it commercially available. What that may mean as well is it may be commercially available without the need for veterinarians. Right now, a veterinarian has to buy the product that administer it. Once they get a commercial use um, license, it may even show up in farm stores and tractor supply stores and in those places where you know farm animal vaccines are. And that's been a fairly hot debate amongst the people who are meat producers or breeders or those people who find it cost prohibitive to take their rabbits to a veterinarian and pay for exams and checkups and, and the vaccine. With conditional approval, we may see this vaccine commercially available for individuals to administer that may not require a veterinarian, but that remains to be seen as well. And I don't know if that's the case or not. So just a little bit on client education, just a review on protecting rabbits. Again, practice good biosecurity. That's key to controlling any infectious disease. And again, let's remember that RHDV2 is not the only infectious disease we deal with with our pet rabbits. We always need to be cautious and careful about the spread of infectious disease, respiratory pathogens, other infectious agents. So practice biosecurity in everything we do anyway. You know, it, it, sometimes we have a rabbit, we wanna get a partner rabbit for them. We wanna get them together right away, but for even bringing a new rabbit into your home, it's always smart to think about a quarantine period because you never know if that rabbit's carrying something that they're gonna give to your other rabbit or rabbits. So, we're using RHDV2 as an example, but again, practice biosecurity. Many people have adopted not wearing shoes in the house, changing clothes. Um, when you work in a shelter or a rescue, or if you're exposed to a lot of rabbits, 
maybe have protective coverings, maybe have a disposable um, gown that you can put over your clothes or be prepared to change. Take those clothes off before you go home to your pet rabbits. I mean, all of these are basic tenants of biosecurity. There are links to um, websites on the House Rabbit Society page that go over all of this in more detail. Um, use effective disinfectants, put screens up to minimize insects, um, know where your hay and feed is coming from, quarantine rabbits at least two weeks. We found that by two weeks, if they seem healthy and normal, they're extremely unlikely to be carrying the disease and, and to be a risk. Can't rule it out, but quarantine period of at least two weeks is generally ideal. And then not touching or being exposed to dead wild rabbits. In any way, be really careful. If you have a dead rabbit and you're a rabbit owner and you find a dead rabbit in your yard, the best thing to do is double and triple bag it. If you're an endemic state, contact your state veterinarian, see what they want to do with it or contact your family veterinarian. Otherwise, you may need to just dispose of it, but just be really careful. Um, you know, you don't want to use a shovel to pick it up and then forget to disinfect that shovel and put it back in your garage, those type of things. Um, just be cautious and careful about, about deceased rabbits. And of course, let's not forget about the population declines in the wild rabbits. Um, for many people that, that don't know this, we have some endangered species of, of wild rabbits that live in this country and wild rabbits are in danger. Um, anytime there's an infectious disease that's aggressive, that spreads through, um, you know, we're, we're seeing wild rabbit populations damaged and potentially decimated. In the past two years, thousands of black-tailed jackrabbits in the Sonoran Desert have died from this. Um, and again, it may have began with domestic rabbits. We assume that. We assume maybe the movement of rabbits from Europe where they had it when we didn't. Um, again, there's no way to pinpoint the exact origin, but RHD joins a list of wildlife diseases that are devastating wildlife. Um, again, you know, there are endangered rabbits with small populations that live in very specific areas. And we just don't want to forget about the fact that this disease um, is, is affecting our wild populations of rabbits. As much as we don't like to think about it, rabbits are a vital part of the ecosystem. I mean, you know, they, they, they exist to help keep that balance that nature has developed. And whether it's, it's the way they live their lives, uh, unfortunately, as prey for other animals, but that's mother nature, that's the natural cycle. But disruptions to that cycle can cause bigger problems, um, especially from a wildlife standpoint, if we see loss of, of a lot of these rabbits from this disease, in some areas where those rabbits are, are food for larger animals, those animals now have to start going other places to find food. And then we start dealing with spread and it's a whole nother lecture about how that affects wildlife. But um, let's just keep in mind some sensitivity towards our wild rabbit populations as well. Um, Rabbit.org, the House Rabbit Society website, has recently been ramped, revamped, and renovated and is looking really hot. There are some links there for RHDV2. General information, a lot of the things I've talked about in this lecture can be found there. Information about biosecurity, protecting your pets, general information, updated information about the disease. Um, so don't hesitate to jump on Rabbit.org if you need some of that information or you want to review any of that. Couple quick tips for rabbit clubs and shows. Um, unfortunately, largely these are not regulated. Um, the American Rabbit Breeders Association, I don't believe to date has come up with any strict standards, but um, rabbits from states or counties that have experienced the disease probably shouldn't be moved around at all, let alone to go to a show where they may be exposed to a room full of hundreds or, or more rabbits. Um, rabbits ideally should have checkups, maybe even a veterinary health certificate to participate in rabbit clubs and shows. Um, equipment and supplies should not be shared at events. Biosecurity should be practiced at these events. Uh, we think about people when we started relaxing with COVID, um, you know, you had to wear a mask. You know, there were hand, hand disinfecting stations. You had to show your vaccine card. Things like that were attempts to help control the spread of disease we can apply some of those things to our rabbit friends as well. So let's not forget about that. There is no cure or treatment for this disease. And that's the, the most important thing to remember. Um, rabbits that we suspect have it, we can provide supportive care. Of course, be careful if they're brought into the veterinary hospital and they're suspected of having the disease, they represent potential contagion. But if they're kept in isolation and treated and they're not gonna succumb to the virus naturally, 
If we can treat those rabbits, they may be able to recover and have the rest of their life. No antiviral drugs work, no medications work. Um, we do have a safe, proven, domestically available vaccine. So basically, what do we know from all this? What is the take home message from this lecture and what we've all learned living in, in the world we're in the last couple of years? Prevention is essential. Vaccination, biosecurity go a long way. Prevention is absolutely essential. Again, educating ourselves, all of you here learning, applying, being able to share this information. Um, I'm a veterinarian at a practice where we see a very large number of rabbits. Actually, they are one of the top mammal patients that we see at our veterinary hospital. So we see a lot of them and we see a lot of rabbit owners that have still never heard of this disease. Um, we talk to them about vaccinating and they have no idea what we're talking about. So vaccination, education, sharing information, spread of word, um, any of those things um, that we can educate other people is going to help with prevention. All of the things we've talked about through the lecture that relate to biosecurity, disinfection, any methods we can to prevent the disease is going to go a really long way. Again, remember to report all potential cases to your veterinarian and your state veterinarian. Get advice on how to proceed from there. And do not move suspect animals. Do not move animals around. Um, in endemic states and just do everything that we each individually can to prevent the further spread of this disease. So in summary, we know that RHDV2 is a dangerous and insidious disease. It's a sticky virus. It lasts and lives for a long time outside of the host, but we know we have good disinfectants that we can help use as part of biosecurity measures. It does continue to spread, like I said from the beginning. It hasn't made its way across the entire United States the way we all thought it would years ago. It's largely staying on the, the West Southwest and even new cases are showing up in the endemic states, but we're just not seeing it. I'm hopeful that we jumped on the bandwagon with vaccination a couple of years ago and that's part of it. Um, once we knew about this, we started restricting movement, state veterinarians started taking a role in it. We took some action that maybe has helped controlling it um, that remains to be seen. It may also be demographics, environmental factors. Um, there's a host of other reasons, but vaccination and biosecurity are very necessary for control of the disease. Again, don't forget about our wild rabbit populations being decimated by this disease. Um, including those types of rabbits that are considered endangered or threatened species. We do not want to lose those. RACV2 still poses no risk to human health, so it really is not something that we have to fear for ourselves, but it's important to remember how devastating it can be for rabbits, and also there is no treatment for it. So the best thing to do is prevent it from ever showing up. Real quick, I wanna let everybody know that Oxbow has started a campaign to fund the distribution of vaccines to rabbit shelters and rescues and various organizations that qualify. So if you don't know about this or you haven't heard about this, Oxbow Animal Health will be in a campaign to distribute free vaccine to support vaccination clinics across the nation. Because the vaccine comes in a multi-dose vial, it only lasts technically a day when you open it. So if there's 10 doses in there, you have to be ready to vaccinate 10 rabbits, which is why people are doing vaccine clinics or veterinarians are scheduling you know, 10 rabbit appointments in a day so that they can use it. If you had to open the vial and give out one or two and throw the rest away, that would be a huge waste. We do hope the company does have individual dosing, but they don't have plan for that just yet. But again, back to this, Oxbow is planning to pay for and cover supporting vaccination. So if you're with a rescue or a shelter or any organization working with a veterinarian that can get the vaccine and re reside in a state that has approved distribution, um, you can reach out to Oxbow Health and contact them or Dr. Colas or any of the people there and get general information, but they're funding free vaccine to promote vaccination. And this in and of itself should be really helpful. And, and again, if you're in a situation where this could benefit you, please follow up on that and do what you can to get that free vaccine and get rabbits vaccinated. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks here to several people. Um, we started an RHDV2 task force a number of years ago to kind of work on countering this, 
creating educational materials, spreading information, helping veterinarians procure the European vaccines, um, anything we could do to help spread awareness. And so thanks to a number of these people for the time commitment they put into this. And I can, I can take any questions that anybody may have. Um, and if anybody has further questions about what was put in the chat, please let me know.